If you're about to develop a game, developing a game, and you want to know how to do really, really, really well in Southeast Asia, this is the panel for you. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce you to the moderator, Chris Natsuami. Booms out. Take it away. All right, cool. Um, so uh, I think we've got a lot of information to go through, and we've got a lot of great panelists today. And my personal pet peeve about panels is when the moderator talks a lot. So I want to give almost all of the session to these guys to talk, and I want to just start with some introductions about uh, who they are. So I want to make these introductions very focused. I want to have uh, three very specific answers. Uh, who are you? What is your personal experience in the industry? So not some corporate shill for your company, but you personally, what has been your experience? And three, and this is important, what was your personal interest in working in publishing in Southeast Asia? Um, so let's start uh, right here with Don, and we'll go that way. Who are you? <laughs> the hard one. Hello? OK, great. So uh, my name is Don Sim. Um, I'm from Questrop. Um, so my Questrop is a subsidiary of the Elite Studios, and my personal experience is uh, that uh, we were indie developer for four years, um, operating in Southeast Asia. Uh, we made feature phones at the start, feature phone games at the start, made a smartphone. Um, so we started Questrop um, because we felt that uh, Southeast Asian publishing landscape is particularly brutal. Um, very, very complex, and we believe that we can help uh, uh, you know, simplify that. And so we do publishing, we also do operations, we also do a whole blunt bunch of services to help get move games from outside of Southeast Asia into Southeast Asia. So that's about it. I'm Jacob, I'm the CEO and co founder of PlayLab. Uh, my personal experience in the industry is not that long. I've only been in gaming for the last three years and 100% at PlayLab. We did scale last year from 20 to 100 guys here in Southeast Asia. So I think we are one of the more bigger ones in headcount. Uh, personal interest in Southeast Asia, haven't been there yet, but we're going into it because mainly we've been doing games producing here, but for global market, where I can see the interesting parts of Southeast Asia now is that the market basically doubled in revenue last year and will double again in next year. So it will start to become a big enough market to really be interesting to be in. Hi, everyone. This is working? OK. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Eric. I'm a BD manager at Yodo One. Personal experience, I haven't been in the industry for that long either. I've been working at Yodo One for the past year and a bit. And then before that, I was on the academic side researching uh, game monetization, actually. My personal interest in Southeast Asia is actually more focused on the developer side. So I think that there is a pretty big wealth of uh, untapped developer talent in Southeast Asia. And I think it's especially interesting because Southeast Asia is kind of at the intersect between uh, Asian art styles, so art styles that are very palatable to you know, Japanese, Chinese players, and also something th and creating something that's in between that and the Western tastes. So personally, I think the games that are coming out of Southeast Asia are something we should all keep an eye on going forward. All right, hi, I'm Stephen Lee. I'm head of publishing at Six Waves. Um, been in the industry for about five years, uh, all with Six Waves, based out of Hong Kong. Um, I guess my personal experience in the industry, uh, aside from that, is that I've been a gamer my whole life, and, and this is kind of like a dream job for me, and it's, a, it's really fun to be able to talk about games with, with like-minded people. Um, and as far as uh, Southeast Asia, um, I guess the first real experience was when I took a trip to Thailand a couple of years ago, and I was surprised at how many people were using Line Messenger to message each other and send stickers and, and, and game invites. Um, and that's obviously exploded, and, and um, for us as uh, a games publisher, we've seen a lot of sort of organic uptake of our games uh, in Southeast Asian market. So we, we start to use that as like a test bed uh, before we sort of launch globally. So um, just here to you know, meet new partners and, and also learn as much as I can. Hi, I'm uh, Tung Nguyen. Uh, I'm the CEO of Spill Games, which is a Dutch-based uh, aggregator of game portals worldwide. We are probably one of the largest, having 130 million uh, MAUs. Uh, out of that, 20 million are coming out of Asia, especially Indonesia. So uh, that is one of the interests uh, why we're here, but also um, because uh, we're looking for developer talents and development studios. 
Uh, my personal experience with uh, the gaming industry is uh, I've been in this industry for uh, 10 years now. I've uh, helped uh, to build Bigpoint, which is one of the larger Western online publishing companies, uh, but also I headed uh, the game subsidiary of uh, ProSieben Z1, which is uh, the largest uh, German TV station company. <coughs> and uh, as of uh, April 1st, I started to work uh, as uh, the CEO of Spill. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Chen from uh, Red Adams. I'm the VP and the co-founder of this company. And uh, our company actually is based in uh, China, but uh, actually we release our game uh, in mainland China, Taiwan, uh, Southeast Asia, and Korea. And personally, I manage the uh, uh, overseas team uh, directly, into, including all the operation and the publishing stuff. And uh, my, uh, my experience within this field is about like five years uh, after joining this company. And uh, about Southeast Asia, actually, I live in uh, Thailand for four years, four, five, five years, a uh, long time ago. And I, I got my kindergarten certificate in Singapore. That's a, it's like a begging home, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So I just realized I actually didn't introduce myself, so I should probably do that too. Um, I'm Chris Natsume. Um, my first game shipped in 1992, so I've been making games however long that is. Um, and I've been running a company in Southeast Asia called BoomZap for the last 10 years. We had our 10-year anniversary in April. Uh, and we do uh, development and we also do publishing here in Southeast Asia with a team of about 70 people spread all across Southeast Asia. But I don't want to talk about me, I want to get directly onto some content. Um, so the, the first sort of big question that I would have and the question that I'm sure everyone uh, out here is really interested in is, where's the money? When we look at Southeast Asia, right now, what is the most exciting part of Southeast Asia? What is the most exciting place for you either as a publisher uh, looking to distribute content in Southeast Asia or as a publisher looking to acquire content in Southeast Asia. What is, what is the most exciting aspect of Southeast Asia to you right now? What, what place or what location or uh, what part of the industry right now is extremely exciting to you? Um, and I'll let anyone who wants to start go ahead and start with that. So uh, for Questra, our, our primary business is really to bring games into Southeast Asia. So um, in terms of target markets, um, the number one target market for us is Thailand. Um, the revenue numbers in Thailand is incredible. Uh, CPI numbers are uh, really, really low, um, and especially if you know how to manage that. Um, and the second market that we are also very interested in is actually Vietnam. Um, so Singapore and Malaysia probably come after that. Um, and Indonesia would be, uh, for us, would be would, because of the, you know, it's, particularly complex there, um, the Philippines will be after that. Um, in terms of uh, revenue numbers um, in, in Singapore in particular, actually it's, it has been quite um, shocking, uh, simply because the market here is so small, uh, but the ARPPUs are extremely high, and I think uh, Singapore ARPPUs are one of the highest, uh, um, definitely within the top five uh, around the world. Um, but again, your marketing here will be challenging. Um, so I'm not. So you know, uh, for our business, um, we've set up an office in Singapore. We've also set up an office in Thailand. Um, we're definitely going to be growing our operations and our publishing side uh, for this region, um, to starting from uh, Thailand. Yeah. Okay. So not to put you on the spot, but you you mentioned in that uh, a couple things that were exciting for you, uh, specifically that the CPI. Uh, was of a certain value and mm. that the RP was a certain value in some of these regions. Mm. Um, can you share any of those numbers in sort of, they don't have to be exact obviously, but can you share sort of the order of magnitude of some of those numbers? So I can't remember the ARP views offhand. Uh, we have actually have a report, uh, insights report about that. I can share that with anybody who's interested. Um, but uh, for CPI numbers, especially for Thailand, um, I think one of the most effective ways of marketing would be to use line free coin. Um, simply because Thailand is such a you know uh, line penetrated uh, in, uh, country, um, everybody is using line dam, and as what Stephen mentioned just now, um, so the potential reach is extremely high. Therefore, potential uh, inventory is also very very high, um, and that is probably the best way to do marketing. Um, in terms of CPI prices, um, I think they're going something about 50 cents USD uh, per per incentivized install. I think there are many ad agencies and ad networks here that can help you with that. But yeah, cool. All right. Not to put you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, being based in Bangkok, uh, those parts, what's really interesting in that market is that when we launched uh, like our first bigger user acquisition campaigns there two years ago when you started doing test markets, we could buy users down to three cents. Really? 
we are also talking uh, casual games back when there's no competition on the market. Uh, but looking forward to today, it's going above 20 cents on it. But the amount of multitudes that it's been doubling with every single month since then, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's say uh, we have a very big active user base in US. Over the last year, the prices probably doubled in US. Over the last years in Thailand, they're 10 times higher now. So where we actually go in is also to, uh, you're asking where the money is. We actually don't see the money yet in Southeast Asia. But what we are doing is that we are aggressively going in to do market grab of all countries because the money will be there in three years after the market doubles again. So right now, I believe you can go into the market, you can make a game that makes a little bit of profit. You could not make a game that is like a more global kind of profit success. Uh, but you can do that in three years when the market is, is fragmented for it. So for our parts, it's land grabbed mainly because uh, prices are just going up and they will keep rising that way for the next three years. Anyone else have something you want to share? Yeah, <coughs> so kind of going from the publisher angle, um, a couple of regions in Southeast Asia that really interest us right now are you know, primarily Singapore, so you have guys like uh, Don, really talented developers who are you know, based out here and at a good intersect between Asia and, West and the Western markets. Uh, I've also you know, seen a lot of really strong developers recently coming out of uh, Thailand, Vietnam, as well as Indonesia, uh, sorry, Malaysia as well. So again, going back to that, I really, really love the art style that's coming out of here, and that's something that keeps bringing me back to this conference. Um, yeah, for us, I think the money has always been, uh, as far as games in our network, uh, Thailand and Singapore have, have led the way. I think Thailand is still number one. Uh, but Singapore, <clears throat> mostly because the infrastructure is so good, um, you know, people have the disposable income to spend, so um, we're still quite keen on those two markets. Okay, um, I think most of the things are already said. Uh, for us, uh, at Spill, um, there are a couple of markets interesting. Uh, in general, we think that uh, Southeast Asia uh, is less comparable if it comes to the, the market potential, the market volume as of today, uh, versus uh, the Western Hemisphere markets like uh, Europe uh, or even uh, North America, for example. But uh, definitely, it's a market uh, to come because uh, the expected uh, smartphone penetra penetration rate is uh, increasing uh, very strong and very fast. Uh, for Spill, as we have a huge uh, user base in Indonesia, this market is for us very interesting from a testing perspective. Uh, so having a large user base there, uh, but uh, actually low uh, disposable income versus Singapore, which is another kind of test market where it's a more mature market, as you already said, and mentioned it's uh, very uh, advanced if it comes uh, to technology and also the purchase power is there, so it's very good to have these two markets compared to each other. Uh, other than that, I think uh, Philippines and, Thai, uh, and, and Vietnam are very interesting. I'm of Vietnamese origin, so it's also my personal interest to take a look in that. Uh, but uh, what we see currently is that uh, there's a very talented uh, developer base there and, and studios. And um, the education is good and also uh, the language skills, if it comes to English, is also very advanced. So it's uh, practically very helpful to be there uh, versus uh, being in countries where you do not uh, really uh, speak the language. Uh, when people talk about like Southeast Asia, they normally talk about like a six country in this region, like uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And for our company experience, uh, if you uh, because uh, uh, we are talking about the money, where the money is. So we see the money from uh, Thailand and Singapore, Malaysia, but we see a lot of downloads from um, Indonesia. And uh, a lot of people saying that uh, Philippines, there are a lot of uh, downloads, but for us, uh, our experience is not. And uh, uh, Vietnam, we need to work with uh, the other publishers because of the restriction of the road between like, uh, the uh, political stuff between uh, China and uh, Vietnam. So um, uh, about like two years ago, I still remember actually Southeast Asia, uh, actually we start to uh, think about this uh, market, but uh, in terms of money, we see, we, we see nothing. But uh, after two years, and actually in this half a year, we see a lot of growth and that there are a lot of potential uh, high pay users, especially in Thailand and the Malaysia region. That's our experience. Okay, so in all of this, um, and that was great information, um, I heard a lot of there are a lot of users or there are massive users or you know, this is a lot of money. Um, I'm curious, 
when you guys looked at the market, and, I'm, I'm, and I don't want to put you on the spot for specific numbers, but can you share with us some specific data points that you found really interesting when you looked at uh, Southeast Asia that you thought defined some of these markets and defined some of these places that you were looking? Or if you're not comfortable sharing those numbers, um, obviously, everyone who's out here who's interested in this, can you share some information about where other people could go find good, reliable information about uh, what ARPU is in some of these places, what download volumes are in some of these places, what revenue volumes are in some of these places? Um, if you can share any actual data on that, or if you can share with us information on where people could get that data, that would be hugely helpful. I think the best data I found on that are new SUS report, ABANI reports. Mm -hmm. Interesting point is that entire Southeast Asia, or 650 million people, uh, they have the same amount of downloads in that entire region as you do in Korea. Uh, <laughs> and that's 50 million people in Korea. Mm -hmm. Revenue-wise, uh, four times lower than Korea for the mm -hmm. entire market. Mm -hmm. Android being uh, four times bigger in terms of download over iOS, mm -hmm. but iOS still making 30% more revenue than Android. Where we can see from our data is that we have whales in especially Thailand uh, that are spending a lot of money in the game. The conversion to, from free to paying users are very low compared to our Western market. But we do have very high middle, uh, middle to high income classes, uh, especially in Thailand, that are spending a lot of money on games. Uh, the housewives that we love having in the games that have a lot of time and money too. I think, I think it's important to clarify uh, this point. I mean, the understanding the market as a whole is always very confusing because Southeast Asia itself is a, has six made up, I mean, the core countries are the six countries, right? And each of the six countries have a very different socioeconomic status, uh, in, you know, in terms of a uh, status quo. And uh, each country being different means that the ARPP use for each country is also very different. Um, and also the point is that we must also understand that the games launching in Southeast Asia is actually very different from the games launching in places like Korea. Um, and so you don't find that many of these high grossing games here because they are not simply not here yet. Um, and you find, I mean, you find like guys like Netmarble and all that with amazing games in, in Korea. Um, and these games are to your typical mid-core, um, very, very in-depth, very, very, uh, you know, with all kinds of monetizing techniques. And the truth is that uh, because these games are not all completely in Southeast Asia, you don't find that um, that kind of um, revenue generation is it's equivalent across the board. You find a lot of casual games here, and generally casual games don't make that much money. So I'm sure you guys know already that uh, typical games make about 1% to 3% um, conversion rate. Um, and of course, um, out of the 1% to 3% conversion rate, 0.5% of, of the total user base makes 50% of all the revenue that's being made. So you have super big whales that are making most money. Um, and, if, and if your games are not targeted for these players, then you won't make that money. So I think that's uh, important to know. And of course, when you look at the data, you need, you need to understand that um, you know, the landscape in terms of the games that come in here and what are the games that are being operated uh, in this region. So uh, just, just a follow-up question on that, and, mm -hmm. and, and not only you, but anyone on the panel who wants to answer. Um, so, so what you're saying is a lot of the games that are monetizing very well in Korea simply aren't here yet. But I, I, to my knowledge um, and, and my research, one of the big issues is just the amount of money that's available to a consumer here compared to Korea. So we have, you know, some, you know, an average income in Korea of a couple, you know, three, four thousand dollars a month versus an average income in the Philippines of something like two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars a month. I mean, it's literally ten times less. So I guess one of my questions is when you're looking at publishing in Southeast Asia and you're looking at titles that are geared to monetize to a, a user who's got $3,000 a month, mm. how do you adjust those titles for the realities of, say, a Philippine or an Indonesian market where the average income is so much lower? So, I mean, in terms of marketing-wise, I mean, uh, let's just face it, right? CPIs don't vary that much. I mean, if you're looking at quantity, if you're looking at small amount of downloads, uh, you can go get it relatively cheap. Uh, but the, the truth is, then, therefore, because CPI, CPI prices are generally pretty high, you want to target countries that have much higher potential. Um, so for us, uh, for Questrop, we actually focus more on Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and, and Vietnam than Indonesia and Philippines, uh, simply because of conversion rates and, of course, ARPU. Um, and that's pretty much um, how we manage that. Yeah. 
Does anyone else have something they could add to Because that seems like a very large sort of barrier in the region. I'd like to talk a little more about it. Yeah, two points I want to share, uh, because the question is about like, where's the money, but uh, you got to know how to make the money. Uh, the one thing is, uh, one tip besides uh, Singapore, actually you got to have the third party payment system, you got to integrate is it. That's how you get the money. So uh, first of all, you, uh, I mean outside of Singapore, you got to integrate with uh, the third, third party payment. The second of all is, uh, actually you don't talk it for everybody, as uh, the previous uh, speaker said. Because uh, actually, uh, for us, uh, we we see some uh, people. We saw some people in Thailand. Actually, they pay. They can pay over thousands, like U.S. dollars, uh, within a month or a couple of weeks. So actually, for us, we we talk it for those uh, like uh, rich kids or something. So uh, there are some uh, people actually who who has uh, like a uh, paying power pretty strong in Southeast Asia. So that's uh, where we are. Who we are focusing on. So just to toss in an example from the China market, which is kind of where Yoda One is based out of. Uh, recently, what uh, Apple did was they changed the structure of the IP pricing, and they actually lowered uh, the price barriers down to one RMB, three RMB, and six RMB. Uh, so before, one US dollar is about six RMB. So you can imagine, you know, with one RMB IAP payments, it's, it's the price barrier has gone down a lot. And I um, expect this is the best way to, just to give a different angle, if this is the best way to tackle the Southeast Asian market, is to try and approach it from uh, using mini IAP bundles, you know, priced at a very, very low price point to try and entice, you know, the first stage of conversion. And then from that point onward, once someone is actually more committed and invested, invested into a game, once they've started spending a little bit of money, it's a lot easier to try and convince them and entice them to spend um, greater amounts of money. So that's, a, that's an approach that worked really well in China so far, and I expect it'll be an approach that will uh, see some, some success, at least in the Southeast Asian market. Uh, also to add, uh, when and uh, so you mentioned about third-party payments, third-party payment gateways often have uh, denominations that are different from the official app store, so you might be able to make payments that are much, much smaller. Uh, and if you are targeting regions that have a lot of users but don't have the capacity to pay that much, you can definitely consider third-party payments for that purpose as well. Hmm. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit, I shift the gears a little bit away from just money, 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 um, and, and talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, in Southeast Asia uh, beyond the, the, the economics. And the first one I wanted to talk about is obviously we're talking about a vast region with a number of languages, a number of cultures, and I'm curious uh, in your plans and the areas that you're looking at publishing into, what languages are you dealing with? What are the challenges of these languages? And then also not just language, but in culturalizing these games and making them something that fits the audience. Uh, what challenges are you facing in specific countries uh, that you have experience in? And, and what do you foresee as being challenges in the future? And let's not start with Don this time, because I've been picking on him. Uh, let's start over at the other end of the table and see what you guys over there have to say. Okay. I think I probably have two points for sure. Uh, one is about the marketing stuff, and the other is about like, uh, uh, the language part. Uh, for the marketing part, actually, uh, so far, we, uh, what the, the challenge we face is, is uh, there are not many uh, marketing channels, I mean, effective marketing channels. So a lot of people are using the Facebook or like uh, LMOB or such and so on. But uh, however, they are, uh, in terms of quality, they are good, but they are also kind of expensive. For us, we, uh, we see the, like, uh, uh, the effective CPI for the Facebook is about like two to three US dollars. But in reality, everybody knows that actually it's hard to make such kind of money out of uh, per person. So uh, that is uh, one of the big challenge. And the other thing uh, uh, to share about is uh, uh, when you uh, have a banner about the graphic part, uh, we realize that uh, uh, for the Chinese people, they like uh, the skin part, they, they like a brighter or whiter. But the Southeast Asia, uh, we localize into like a something darker. So that's our uh, experience. And uh, the other thing is about the language part. Uh, actually, uh, we localize, uh, so far we only have uh, English and the Chinese version. But uh, uh, I would highly recommend you guys to uh, think about uh, Thailand and uh, 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 Malaysia and uh, uh, what's that? Uh, Indonesia language because uh, actually a lot of people can still not speak uh, in English very well. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with what Andrew just said. Um, we've primarily launched our games in English and uh, at least back in the, the social days and um, saw plenty of uptake. Um, I think the good news is a lot of people speak English in Southeast Asia. Um, but uh, as we move into mobile, um, a lot of our games are coming from 
sort of greater China where it's like a little bit more anime style, more chi <coughs> Chinese themes, um, and they seem to perform very well here as well, just looking at, at the charts. So um, in terms of localization, we're going to go Thai um, as well as uh, stay, stay with English and Chinese, and we probably won't need to do too much uh, culturalization other than that, but uh, I think the first language of, uh, for us will be Thai. I think for us, uh, from a business perspective, uh, it's very challenging because uh, I don't think that you can um, buy performance-based advertising on a profitable basis, but be, or it's very challenging to put it this way. <coughs> and also in this regard, it's uh, probably also very challenging to have a culturalization because that means that you have to go deep into the game and you have to maintain and also constantly change the game or enhance it with features. And that only makes sense if uh, on a P&L basis the game becomes profitable and uh, in these markets we don't see it right now yet, not yet, uh, it'll come, but for the time being we'd rather go for uh, just one language or maybe because of Indonesia, because in our, from our uh, asset perspective uh, we have an audience there so it makes sense to, uh, to localize them there, the language, but only language part, but other than that we'd rather go into the markets where English, English is the main language because then it's uh, for us uh, less efforts and uh, related to uh, invest and pay back, uh, it has a better uh, ratio for us. So I'm curious, we're talking about language and, 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 and that's important. Uh, I'm curious also in terms of genre, in terms of what kind of games. Um, and I think everyone wants to give a good story, you know, this is what we've done and this is what's worked. I think what would also be very interesting is if you guys had any stories about things that you did, whether with language or with uh, certain genres of games or certain themes. Uh, in games that didn't work or that you have a negative example where you're like, yeah, we tried this and it was totally not a good thing. Um, I know people don't like to share that information very often, but it would be great if you had any such stories. But I'd be interested in your thoughts on what kind of games in terms of genre and also in terms of technology, in terms of the size of the download, in terms of uh, whether or not it's uh, hooked up to a server, whether or not it's uh, got multiplayer. What sort of things right now have you seen that are working well in Southeast Asia and what sort of things are not working well in Southeast Asia? And I'd actually like to, to start this one with Stephen because we haven't started in the middle yet. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, let, let me, let me uh, take that one. So I guess uh, genre-wise, uh, we've had a lot of success with casual puzzle titles. Mm -hmm. um, your you know usual match three kind of mechanics or, or similar type of uh, games. Um, Jacob could probably add a lot more about that. Um, we've also tried. It's really funny. We had a game on, on Facebook a couple of years ago with Jackie Chan, and um, for some reason, that's there's a lot of fans here in Southeast Asia that have continued to play the game, even though there's not a lot of updates being made to it. Um, so that does kind of clue in that IPs are important. Fans are, are very loyal to. Um, specific, uh, I guess, entertainment brands or IPs. So, so Jackie um, Chan is obviously a Southeast Asian brand. H right. How have you found that brands and IPs from outside of Southeast Asia have performed? Um, I think certain, certain ones do perform very well. Um, you have very kind of ravenous fans in, in for certain things like, you know, uh, EPL teams, that kind of thing. Um, I would say um, Line in particular, I, we keep coming back to Thailand, but um, you know, they've done a great job of integrating their IPs all over the market. Um, I saw like a cookie run guy like on the subway, all over the subway car, and it, it's just pretty, it's pretty impressive how they've done it. Um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much more time, so I'll let So who else know. has some thoughts on this? I think there's, this is a, you could do a whole panel on yeah, just this topic, sure. so I'm curious yeah. if anyone else has any other thoughts. If you're asking for concrete examples of what not to do, uh, we have a farm game coming out, and we removed pigs from the entire tutorial when we launched in Malaysia. <laughs> do okay. not do tutorials where it's like touch the pig and make a combination. Like it's okay to have it in the game, but it was just like funny things that we could see because w how I see the market is that it's been neglected for so long that you cannot point at any game and saying, "Oh, that's a very Thai game. That's a very Malaysian game," because it's been so neglected that it's used to playing translated. Japanese Chinese content or Western games uh, so it's actually easy entry to the market it reminds me a little bit about growing up in Denmark and the only morning TV I had was German TV and at some point you just get used to it and that's good enough content and you get used to playing that so coming from mobile games in Southeast Asia it's been neglected for so long that it will still take plenty of years to have specific game titles that really stand out and can really generate a Thai game culture or Indonesian game culture for mobile, for the mass market. Mm -hmm. Let me sh 
share uh, our experience. Actually, we are uh, we are good in a uh, car battle, and uh, we found that car battle game actually in Southeast Asia is doing well also. And uh, also like a uh, theme actually uh, like martial art and uh, three kingdoms are working well in. Uh, in, in Southeast Asia, because a lot of, uh, like in terms of culture, actually influenced a lot by Chinese culture. So uh, places like uh, we've, uh, like uh, Vietnam, or like uh, uh, over, over the place, actually, the is, is okay. Yeah, that's what we found, yeah. If you look, just add one more, from a data point of view, if you look amount of downloads, it's definitely Western games all the way through. If you look at monetization, it's RPG, it's Chinese, Japanese translated games. So our thinking art style wise, people can play everything, but what really monetizes are still like the, the weekly tournaments, the Thursday tournaments, the events. You have a lot more live operations on the Southeast Asian markets than you would have on a Western market. Uh, the games that they play are still though Western looking. Okay, great. Um, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit more. So one of the things that was brought up earlier was distribution channels uh, and that there were payment issues. Um, I think everyone here on this panel, myself included, uh, know all this sort of as common sense, but there may be some people out there that are not aware of the payment uh, issues in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone would like to kind of walk through a little bit for the benefit of those who don't know the kind of payment issues that we're seeing in Southeast Asia and how we are putting together plans for working through those payment issues. So I'll just start off uh, by saying that um, the, I mean, diff uh, compared to many of the matured markets like say in Japan and Korea, uh, the biggest problem in Southeast Asia in terms of payment would be credit card pe penetration. Um, and it's particularly so, for example, in Indonesia, we're looking at about 2.6%. Um, in Vietnam, about 1.5%. Um, uh, from, compared from different sources, but generally, it's really, really bad. Um, and the truth is that, um, of course, the people that do hold these credit cards, this small amount of people, um, are the richest people, probably. Um, and they have the, most, uh, the highest ability to pay. But if you want to monetize a ma uh, mass market or the bigger market, um, you definitely need to integrate third-party payment. Um, and how you integrate that, and, and, and of course, via either you're sneaking it into your know, App Store and Google Play, shh, don't talk about that, uh, or uh, you're doing it through third-party App Store, so you're doing direct APK distributions. Um, that's the many ways to do it. Uh, but integrating third-party payments is definitely crucial. Um, and, and I think that's, and if you just look at the, the audience uh, in Cash Connect, to today, you find that there are a lot of third-party payment companies all over here because it's so 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 crucial, um, and and if you want to make money, you have to do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add to. It's basically about knowing your audience and knowing also what type of game you're doing. If you're doing a casual game and you're trying to sell five more moves people are not going to walk down to a 7-Eleven to buy coupons or enter it into your game to get those five more moves because it's too casual. So you can only depend on carrier billing. Google is actually doing a great job for the last year of expanding that rapidly. They expanded so much that we kind of cancel our own plans, at least for, for Android, to do the payments uh, because they can get a lot better deal than we can. Um, but if you're into the more hardcore RPG games where you actually have people that really want to walk that extra mile literally to pay something in your game, it will work. So just to kind of echo what was previously said, um, the same problems came up in China a couple of years back and they were addressed by the carrier billing solutions. So that carrier billing gave access to you know, regular people who didn't necessarily have you know, a 7-Eleven nearby or within a mile uh, or credit cards and it gave them the chance to be able to make in-app purchases through their uh, cell phone bill. And that actually spiked uh, Chinese just mobile revenues on the whole uh, dramatically uh, when carrier billing was first introduced through all the different carriers. And I expect the same thing's gonna happen relatively soon in Southeast Asia as well. So I'd like to, I think we've, we've, we've sort of covered that. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the difference between the Southeast Asian market and some of the markets that the audience may be uh, more aware of. Uh, and I, I'd like to specifically start uh, with talking about the differences between the Chinese market and the Southeast Asian market. Uh, when I talk to people outside of Southeast Asia, they always want to talk to me about, you know, I've made a game for Asia. And they say, oh, yeah, this is going to do great in Asia. And I have to kind of be like, well, there's not really 
an Asian market. We have to talk about the different markets. So I'd actually like to really start with Eric uh, or, some, uh, or some of the other folks who have some deep experience in China about the difference between what you're seeing in Southeast Asia and what we're seeing in China. And then I'd actually like to hear about, uh, uh, and, and maybe Jacob is a great person to start on this, the differences that you're seeing between a more Western market and the market that we're seeing in Southeast Asia. Uh, who would like to start? Eric, would you like to? Sure. So this was brought up a bit earlier as well, um, and a similar situation happened in China. But Southeast Asian gamers have traditionally been playing Chinese, Japanese, and Korean games. As a result, they're pretty accustomed to the game styles. Uh, that being said, uh, so let me rewind a bit, going back to the Chinese situation. So in China, a lot of Chinese players grew up playing Korean games because Korea was kind of the leader in uh, game development, and then the games just slowly migrated away into China. But what actually happened over time is that uh, Chinese gamers and Chinese game developers started developing a style of their own. And nowadays, if you look at what a Chinese game is, it's quite a bit different from what a Korean game looks like. And I expect the same thing is going to happen soon in Southeast Asia. So Chi Southeast Asian players, uh, as was mentioned before, they played a lot of Korean, Japanese, and Chinese games. Um, but even today at the, uh, at the, uh, idea, pan at the idea area, uh, where a lot of the indie developers are showing, showcasing their games, I saw a very unique uh, Thai Endless Runner that was based around uh, Rama, I guess is one of the... Uh, uh, Thai cultural um, or myth mythological characters. And so that was a really unique thing for me because this is really a, a really Thai game and it's only ever going to do well in Thailand, but you know, this is a game that's designed and catered for the Thai players. I think this is going to uh, come up a lot more in the near future. Okay, I probably can share some experience since we are, uh, we are quite successful in China. And um, actually, if you uh, go to see the mobile like, gaming industry uh, back to like uh, three to four years ago, you can find out that uh, some uh, medium to small player and uh, they are good, they were good. But nowadays, it's more like uh, the like, uh, big company, big name companies such as Tencent, Perfect World, such a company. And if you look at the top 50 of uh, like a top grossing within the iOS, most of the games, like over, over about like 50% are Tencent. Like uh, the, the rest of it are such kind of a uh, big console game or like a uh, web game company. So uh, as a uh, previous speaker said, uh, there are more and more like a Chinese, like a mad, like their own game. So it's very different than Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia, so, uh, currently there are not uh, many like a local uh, developer, they are quite kind of successful. Majority of the like the titles are like from uh, China or Japan or Korea or other the rest of the world. So it's a very different. And um, the other thing is, uh, uh, in China actually recently there are more and more casual games, but not many. But in Southeast Asia, uh, if you see uh, like uh, especially in uh, Thai, there are a lot of lines pretty popular there. So there is like a Thai uh, line, like a casual game, very popular in Southeast Asia. So uh, uh, what we think is about like uh, besides uh, Singapore and uh, the rest of the Southeast Asia, actually it's about <coughs> like a two years behind of a uh, uh, current Chinese market. So let's, let's shift gears to the West. Um, and obviously Jacob has some opinion, but if anyone else has some opinions about that, I'd, I'd be curious there as well. I would say there are two things, uh, one being platforms and second being community. Platforms meaning that I'm still dreaming of a day that I can allow my user to choose to log in with WeChat, with Line, with Kakao, with Facebook, whatever they choose of the preference to log in. <laughs> Uh, because that's not gonna happen. The only one that you can do that with is Facebook. They don't really care about what game you're integrated to. You could not do Kakao and Line in the same game, mm -hmm. even though the user actually wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot more mobile focus. There's a lot more uh, market to be gained through those mobile markets here uh, compared to in the Western world. Second, uh, community. You will not walk around in a US mall and see an offline event for a game. Uh, where I feel like that what I can see from the highest monetizing games and the games doing very well here, they care a lot about the community and they actually care about the players after they downloaded the game. Uh, where if you look into most Western type of games, you download the game and that's it. Like there's no community, there's no support, there's nothing around it. You do not have a gathering or social event around it. Uh, you kind of it's probably also because the users on the more Western, they hide that they play a game. They're not too proud of it. Where compared to China, if you actually bought something, it's like, yeah, I spent a thousand dollar fuckers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, that was a camera, sorry. Uh, so 
at least the, the offline event part here and the community they can build around it, which is also reasons why we are exploring how to actually better talk to our community here, how to directly integrate uh, mobile messaging with our users compared to using emails or other support type of tools, uh, because it's really important. Yeah, I just want to echo your, your thoughts about the gaming culture in Southeast Asia. It's always surprised me as well. And I, I know that Taiwan is not officially Southeast Asia, but I remember last time I went to Taiwan, if it, you turn on your TV after 10 o'clock at night, every single ad is a game ad. And you would never see this in America or, or Germany. And, and just the, the depth to which the gaming culture is pervasive in Asia and certainly in Southeast Asia. And like you say, the, the level to which people are willing to admit and talk about games and be involved in gaming events and live events, it's, it's been very surprising. Uh, Steven, you're nodding a lot. Maybe you have some you yeah, want to share? A lot of what you guys have just said sort of ties together. So like uh, one of the things we saw in China is that they do a lot of aggressive sort of VIP programs and you pay a little bit up front and you get you know, some advantages in the game mm -hmm. and, and they kind of hook you and it's almost like a, a regular subscription type of model within the game. Um, so that has worked really well. Japan, one of the reasons why their games are successful for so long is um, meticulous like CS and, and, custom, and, and taking care of their whales mm -hmm. and, and coming out with new stuff to feed them, like new content, collaborations, that kind of thing. Um, I agree with you um, in the West that it's not quite there yet um, and I think Southeast Asia in particular is taking cues from sort of North Asia, China as well in recognizing that, you know, maybe we can't charge the same level of, of you know, for, you know, premium currency or whatever as, as, let's say, as aggressively as North Asia, but if we take care of our players, and I think that's what, you know, people like Don's company are doing is help to provide the infrastructure to do that, and, and same for you, Chris. So, I mean, if you take care of your players and, and they recognize that as a gamer myself, um, if I feel like the developer is not taking care of their players, I'm going to leave and play something else, right? So yeah. um, it's very important to breed that loyalty, and I think that long-term retention will help to pay off. Okay, I think we're. I want to leave time for questions and and make sure that we have we have time for people from the audience to to, to ask. This is an extremely uh, experienced group of individuals. Uh, I want to ask one last general question before we go to the floor. And so now you can start thinking about your questions. But while they think about the questions they want to ask, I want to ask uh, a very broad question, which is looking out three to five years. Uh, what do you think, and, and there's the obvious answers that we've already talked about. Uh, what do you think is surprising that will happen in Southeast Asia over the next three to five years? What do you think people don't expect, but you personally have a, a dream or a thought of something that might be interesting in three to five years, specifically about the way that the industry is growing in Southeast Asia? I know that's a hard question, um, but I'm curious if anyone has any thoughts about that. Um, actually, my prediction for Southeast Asian region is that there's going to be some kind of consolidation. Uh, the market has been so so fragmented that um, you know it's almost it's extremely difficult to run your games and run your business um, in each country. But with the different services and different tools um, available and different ga you know, payment gateways, like for example, uh, Money Online is practically in every Southeast Asian country right now. Um, and it, there's going to be a consolidation in terms of the services first. And once the infrastructure is in place, um, there's going to be a consolidation in terms of publishing. Um, and in that case, then there will be a rising of potential champions in publishing. Um, when you're talking about uh, Japan, you look at Gangho and Mixi. You talk about China, you look at Tencent. Korea, you look at, you talk about uh, net marble, right? So Southeast Asia doesn't have that yet, um, and it's really, And my prediction is that that's going to happen soon. Um, I mean, over the next couple of years, and that will f that will first come uh, because there will be a consolidation of services, and companies that provide certain services in certain countries will then eventually move beyond the boundaries into the next country, the next country, um, and when that happens, um, it will become easier to then market your games, easier to operate your games. Yeah. For, for the next three to five years, that's basically, we are betting everything on that. Because I do unfortunately think that you can look into China and see what will happen. I think we are maybe five years behind that. When the market gets big enough to care about, magic things will happen and the rest of the world will start caring. Right now we only care because we are based here and the market is big enough to become interesting enough for us. 
when it's big enough to become interesting enough for outside players that are very big companies that include Southeast Asia as part of their launch plan and not as a let's put the game there and translate it a, a year after. Mm. Uh, that's when it becomes competitive and that's why you will start to have people that are owning the market, owning this distribution. Uh, and I'll be honest and saying we're going directly for that. <laughs> I, I know your feelings well. <laughs> Uh, so I think what Jacob said is like really on point. Uh, China really is what Southeast Asia is going to be in the next three to five years, right? And if you look, the first catalyst is going to be smartphone penetration. Right now, they think the rate in Southeast Asia is about 25 to 30 percent, uh, which is you know getting there. But once and then once you know that number starts growing, everyone's going to pick up a smartphone. And what's the first app you download on a smartphone? It's going to be a game. It's going to be Crossy Road, right? Um, going on top of that. Um, when Southeast Asian players start buying into new smartphones, new hardware, uh, that's when players like Xiaomi uh, in China, who are really good at producing, uh, Xiaomi and Oppo, so a couple of hardware producers in China, are really good at producing cheap but very efficient and high quality uh, cell phones. And once players start having you know, a phone that's more, much more than just a feature phone, that's when higher quality games are going to start being able to penetrate the market. So in three or five years, I think you know, I, my predictions are fairly consistent with everyone else's. It's going to be uh, the next Chinese market, hopefully. Uh, to me, I think the hope for Southeast Asia would be that we have uh, more uh, local content and local heroes coming up. Uh, just take a look at Vietnam with Flappy Bird, for example. And uh, if you take a look into the Western markets, you see in the top crossing charts, especially top 10, for example, uh, top 10 to top 20, it's like a winner takes it all. You always see Supercell, uh, you see uh, Machine Zone, you see King, etc. And uh, uh, these players uh, are making the competition among themselves. Uh, so my hope, uh, as uh, the local markets here are still not very s saturated or mature, that there is the chance for a local champion to come up and maybe then dominate more or less the local region within Southeast Asia, but not being dominated by the Western heroes or by the Chinese ones, you know, like Tencent. <laughs> When I hear the question, I'm thinking about like uh, because it's talking about the future of uh, like three to five years. So I'm thinking about like uh, what uh, what happened in the past like three and five years. Uh, if we go back to three or five years ago, I think Southeast Asia, in terms of the the penetration of a smartphone, is pretty low. So we can see right now it's a certain number. So uh, I I can see like three to five years later going to be way higher than now. And uh, very likely, I think uh, Google Play or iOS, uh, Apple, they would do something to uh, to uh, prohibit the, I mean, to, to restrict the uh, third-party payment. Because if the, the region of the market is big enough and they cannot make any money, they would do some actions. That's what my prediction. So I'll, I'll add with, with my thought on this. Um, I, I'm also working in the region, and I, I have a, a thought. And I, I agree with everything that, that we've heard. I think these are things that are going to happen. But, but what I think is going to happen is, is, that, is this part of the world gets more interesting. People from outside of this part of the world are going to want to get involved in this. And so while I wish, you know, it would certainly be nice, and it would probably make me more popular locally if I said, yeah, some great big Thai studio or, or Filipino studio is going to be the next Tencent. Um, I think probably the next Tencent in Southeast Asia has a really good chance of being Tencent. Um, exactly. And that there's a lot of money. When I, I was most recently up at a convention in China, and almost every Chinese publisher I talked to wanted to talk to me about their upcoming Southeast Asia plan, right? Um, people like Google and Amazon are moving into Southeast Asia. So I think a lot of the names that you're going to hear in this uh, new Southeast Asia that, that matters, as, as Jacob says, are going to be pretty familiar names uh, because those people are going to find that there's a good interest here as well. I, I don't know. You guys may disagree, but that's, that's my feeling in the matter. And on that, um, I would like to open the panel up to questions. Um, has anyone got anything that you would like to ask this extremely qualified group of individuals? Uh, behind China, um, uh, what? And you say actually we can learn a lot from China. What can we learn from China? Uh, would anyone like to answer what we can learn from China? China. 
Well, I think China's, the model and how things have evolved is quite unique given, uh, part of that is mostly due to um, how prevalent Tencent is everywhere in China. So they control not only the messaging on the mobile, but also the instant messaging on the PC, the, the PC-based social network. Um, so, you know, I kind of liken them, I always refer to them as Skynet of China. So, um, I, I would say that that's the piece that's missing in Southeast Asia. I mean, sure, Line is doing okay, um, in, specifically in Thailand, but um, there's not that sort of prevalence throughout the region yet. Um, so, I think it will take some time uh, to evolve and then, and then we'll probably see some major players in consolidation. I think the one similarity, um, and of course the learning point would be that, I mean, how China grew and exploded from uh, 2012 to 13, um, in terms of the smartphone gaming market, um, you can possibly identify trends and, and signs of that in Southeast Asian countries individually. One of the biggest problems between Southeast Asian countries is that they're just culturally different. They have different languages, they're different countries. So if you look at Southeast Asia, you cannot think of it as one country. Um, however, individual countries have different rates of growth and different rates of explosion in terms of um, this, this growth. Um, and, and that's interesting to watch. Uh, so I think one of the most interesting lessons out of China is how to monetize uh, the, the wider market. So everyone's always talking about going after the whales, and that's obviously a very good business model. But I think in China, uh, it's been proven that you can also go after minnows and, you know, not do too badly yourself. So, like I was saying earlier, using the mini IAP bundles to really turn that initial conversion to really get the player thinking, okay, I already spent one RMB, now I can spend maybe by the next tier, which is three RMB. In the grand scheme of things, that's only a 50 cent IAP. Um, but starting that process, starting that, uh, building that behavior into the players is the right way to go about monetizing the larger group. And if you look at Southeast Asia, it's such a huge market. Uh, there's only ever going to be so many whales, but if you can turn the minnows into dolphins, that's something that's much more interesting to play with. Actually, the other thing also is that um, if you look at the top crossing charts in Southeast Asia, you find that there are actually a lot of Chinese games. Um, and the Chinese games, um, by the way they're designed and, and the ones that we've seen, um, they are designed to sort of milk whales to begin with. Um, and in that sense, um, with the, most of the revenue um, coming from, the, of course, the top crossing charts, you can tell that it's actually the whales that are driving the market um, right now. And so what, uh, what, what Eric was saying is that um, turning minnows into dolphins, that's interesting, definitely. Uh, but as of the current landscape, it really seems like the whales are, are, are really giving you your numbers. And so the games that are making real money are the games that actually are targeted to, to allow these guys uh, with the capacity to pay to pay. I'd, I'd like to actually differ a little bit from, from this opinion. And this, again, this is purely an opinion. Uh, one of the things that I think the real key to success in China has been figuring out the, the minnow part, honestly. Um, I think there's been a lot of thought put into how do we bring the download size of a game down to something really, really small. I mean, there's, there's games in China that are making a lot of money that are 10 megabytes. Right. And, and nowhere else in the world is this the case. Right? This is a Chinese phenomenon. But it's not because Chinese people like small games. It's because they have terrible infrastructure and, and they need to figure out how to get uh, small games that will, that will work on the internets there. This is a very similar problem in the Philippines and Indonesia. You're also talking about countries with, and my apologies to the Philippines and Indonesia, terrible infrastructure. Um, and c dealing with that, dealing with, with what happens with my online game when suddenly I don't have internet right now. Um, being able to solve these challenges in the Chinese market, I think those are huge lessons that Southeast Asia can learn from. And I know in my own personal business, one of my interests in going and finding content in China is finding content from people who've already dealt with those challenges, as opposed to somebody in Germany or in Korea who's used to everyone having you know, a one gigabit connection and a 4G everywhere and having a 400 megabyte game and not thinking about it. Uh, that's going to be an issue in the Philippines. Just one thing to add to that, one thing I think that will not be the same as in China is that I feel Southeast Asia is a lot more prepared for that growth than going to happen over the next three years than China was. Like Google Play was never into China. You don't have any of the Android phones. You will not see 400 plus stores around Southeast Asia. You might see a few but you can see Google and Apple is not going to let that happen. They really force into in infrastructure now, uh, so nobody else have to do it. And I think that 
the heavy smartphone penetration throughout the market looking three years ahead, you will still have those two big uh, platforms that you can distribute on without having to care so much about the rest. I do believe that one or two more stores will enter the market, but I'm very, very happy that it won't be 400 entering the market. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but I think that's a Chinese phenomenon because of the regulations there, um, and uh, probably that uh, doesn't happen somewhere else in the world. All right, so I want to make sure we, we, we've beaten that question to death. Um, do we have some more questions from the audience? I have the question from the panel. You see, you mentioned the games, the, the Chinese market. So you more talk about uh, Chinese market there. My question is about what's your impression of the game itself in China? Could you repeat that? So the last part. I would like to uh, you see to listen to you your impressions about the games developed by the local developer in China, about their quality, about the game design, about the game content. As it as it applies to Southeast Asia, or yes. Okay. No, yeah, their impression when they see look at the Chinese games. I think if you look at China, at China, if it comes to games or the supply of games, that's just uh, such a huge amount uh, compared to Southeast Asia. And I think in general, the quality is taking up, really. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be my impression. Uh, if you see uh, like uh, one type of game or genre of gaming uh, is popular or successful in China, I, I think like uh, within a couple of weeks, you can see the copycat of that. But so far, Southeast Asia, I didn't see that yet. So that's a very different. Yeah, I would say not sometimes even a couple of days. Um, uh, but uh, as far as Southeast Asia goes, I mean, we've all kind of talked about how Chinese games have performed well in these markets. Um, but one of the really cool things about Southeast Asia is that it's not um, homogenous. It's kind of a very diverse mix of different cultures and, and um, just looking over next door at the, the indie booths, I, I see a lot of games that are incorporating best elements and practices from not only China, but also from games on the West and Europe and, and North America. So that's really, really encouraging. Yeah, I would, I would add, by the way, I mean, we talk a lot about China that we kind of got on that tangent. But if you go look at the top charts in Southeast Asia, Candy Crush is there, Clash of Clans is there. Um, so there are games from the West that are also doing very well in Southeast Asia. So I think it speaks to what uh, the panel is saying about there being a diversity uh, and an ability to bring a diversity of games to Southeast Asia, uh, which I think is a great note to leave the panel on. We are now at 59 minutes, so I think we have to bid everyone adieu. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists. This was extremely informative. Uh, I learned things, and I hope everyone else did as well. And thank you very much. Thanks, Chris.